All right, so I want to start by saying thank you to everyone for attending today. I'm very excited to be welcoming you to our session on home safety and assistive devices. My name is Amy and I'm going to take us through a brief orientation and then hand things off to our fantastic speaker, Archana Ritaren. Thank you. Um, she is not only gracious in her support, but she is also an occupational therapist in good standing with the College of Occupational Therapists in Ontario and a member of the Ontario Society of Occupational Therapists. She's currently working as an OT case manager with the Acquired Brain Injury Team at the Scarborough Centre for Health, Healthy Communities. But prior to her joining the SCHT, SCHC team, Archana has obtained experience in the assessment and treatment of individuals with physical, neurological, psychological, and cognitive impairments. She has worked with individuals with a wide range of diagnosis from developmental delay to acquired brain injury to stroke and orthopedic injuries. She is an ADP authorized and has experience with completing home safety and assessments. And and providing recommendations to increase the safety of the home. And so I think that'll be applicable to lots of us today. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Amy. So again, my name is Archana. Um, right now I am working with the ABI outreach team with the CHC. Um, so as Amy mentioned, I did work with VHA completing home safety and mobility assessments. Um, so I've just been with the CHC for the last six months. Um, so today's presentation is about home safety and assistive devices. Um, so it's a big topic, so feel free to stop me at any time. If you have any specific questions, that should be fine. You could unmute yourself and just stop me in the middle. Um, and, let me, and let me know even if I'm going too fast uh, or talking too fast, uh, that should be okay too. Um, so before I go into the details about home safety, I wanted to go through some facts about falls. Um, the primary reason I usually get called in to do an assessment is because of falls. Um, falls are the most common cause of injury among older Canadians. One third of Canadians who are 65 and older are likely to fall at least once. Falls are one of the leading injury-related hospitalizations among seniors. So uh, Public Health Agency of Canada reports that one-third of seniors who are hospitalized are placed in long-term care. Um, these statistics validate the importance of completing a home safety assessment to reduce the risk of falls. <clears throat> So what is a home safety assessment? A home safety assessment is an evaluation of the home and the person to determine safety, function, and comfort of people in their homes. It identifies risks and potential hazards that exist at home. And as I mentioned before, most of the uh, referrals that I got when I worked at VHA is because of falls or hospitalizations after falls. <clears throat> Uh, so a home safety assessment is usually conducted in the client's house with the client. And I try usually to involve uh, the key caregivers as part of the assessment so that I could get more information and then make recommendations that are appropriate to the caregiver, the client, and the environment that they're living in. Um, so the use and benefits of home safety assessment, it helps to recommend appropriate modification. It improves accessibility in and around the home. It decreases risk of falls. It keeps people living independently at home and remain at home as long as possible. Um, home modification interventions that are delivered by OTs can reduce falls up to 45%. Uh, home modification recommendations are usually individualized for the person and their environment. So not all modification will work for everyone. Um, once the assessment is done, um, the healthcare practitioner can help you figure out which modification would work for you and the and your care um, and the person that you're taking care of and modifications can be small or large so OTs can ensure uh, furniture is at the right height for transfers they can advise on bathroom design floors surfaces and grab bars advice on lighting for those with vision loss, 
evaluate furniture placement, look at structural factors and doorways, and also other areas of your house that might need um, changes depending on the use. <clears throat> so first I'm gonna go through general tips for home safety. This applies to anyone. Um, this might sound like common sense, but these are small things that are often overlooked and leads to the most number of falls. So small things such as turning on lights, um, the home needs to be well lit so that you can walk around safely, especially when you're using a walker, uh, moving around the house becomes uh, difficult, especially at night. So turning on lights, um, using night lights or indoor step lights. So those are the, um, the picture that I have there has the step lights. Um, the light over, like the light that you put on is good, but having a step light helps you see each individual step when you go up the stairs. Um, clearing the cutter, uh, walkways should be clear of obstacles um, so that moving in and out of the house is easier. Uh, removing rugs or mats or even putting um, double tape at the bottom of the mat or non-slip uh, treads at the bottom would help as well. Uh, drying bed areas on floors to avoid slipping. Um, and also an important tip that I always tell my clients is to have a portable phone with them um, just so in case they fall or if something happens, they have easy access so they're not on the floor for a long period of time. Um, and also to have something to sit down, like a place to sit down when putting on and taking off clothes. These are just general tips that applies for everybody. Now I can go through each section of the house so that um, if I'm not covering something, you can always stop me and ask me. So I'm gonna just go through each area of the house and things I usually see and recommend uh, to people. So installing railings on, this is for the home entrance. So installing railings on outdoor staircase pathways and decks, preferably on both sides. Uh, repairing loose, cracked, uneven steps. Uh, Installing mailbox at an easy to reach height. Entrance door should be easy to open and close. So lever handles, automatic door openers are some options that I usually provide. And placing a seat inside the entrance to put, to put on or remove footwear. And if a mobility aid such as a walker or wheelchair is used, there's different options they provide uh, like a threshold ramp porch lift or stair lift. So for example, on here, I have the home entrance uh, with double railings installed on the left top corner. And then there I have a um, automatic door opener. So it's just a press of a button and it can easily open the door or close the door, especially when the doors are heavy. And if you have arthritis, that might be difficult to open the door, that helps. And if that automatic door openers are sometimes expensive, so um, a small change that you can make is just make it lever handles instead of the twist knobs. So it's easy to just use your wrist to open and close the doors. Um, so those are small changes that you can make and also, as well as large. Um, and this one here, I put the ramp, the threshold ramp, the picture of a threshold ramp, especially when you're using a walker, you don't wanna be lifting the walker up and down the steps that causes falls. So a small threshold ramp eases that and lets you go in and out much more easily. Uh, and on the right top, I have a picture of a porch lift and at the bottom, a stair lift. So the difference between the two, especially when you have a wheelchair, the porch lift is much more easier um, to get in and out of the house because it'll lift the whole Mobility 8 Plus yourself in and out of the house. You don't have to get up or move. Mm -hmm. With the stair lift, these are for people who have a walker they can hold on to, or um, if you have a caregiver who can help you with the walk and you can go up and down the stair lift. So that's when I would recommend a stair lift. So um, the next section of the house is the bedroom that I want to cover. Um, so most seniors, um, most older people have problems with posture or hypertension, which is uh, when a change in position can lead to a drop in blood pressure. So getting on and off the bed becomes very difficult. Um, you can feel lightheadedness and that can also increase the risk of falls. So having, ensuring that the bed is the right height for you to get on and off safely. So furniture races at the bottom 
or adjustable beds to ease with transfers. Um, so I'll just show you the picture on the next slide. Give me one second. There you go. So on the keeps on going. On the right top, uh, I have the furniture risers. So those are four blocks that are put at the bottom uh, that helps to increase the height. So it's easier to get on and off. This is uh, the simpler solution that I give, especially um, hospital beds are expensive and it becomes difficult to afford it. So for some people, um, it's just a simple solution as putting the four blocks at the bottom raises the bed a little bit higher, depending on the bed you have. Um, some vendors are willing to trial um, furniture rices. So you can even call them and ask them to come and trial those. So those are furniture rices to help um, lift the uh, height of the bed. And then bed rail um, can also help to get in and off the bed. Uh, or you can use the floor to ceiling pole that the lady over here is using. Um, so it comes with the vertical and the horizontal bar to hold on and get on and off. These are simple solutions that you can use. Uh, to get on and off, or um, the hospital beds would be the other option. Hospital beds can range from $1,200 to $10,000. So there's a huge range of hospital beds that are available. Um, the funding for hospital beds are limited, um, especially because um, um, it, it depends more on the need of the client. So it is possible, but you would have to apply for it and see if you will qualify for funding. Um, I think Toronto Hardship Fund does hospital beds, but again, that depends on your financial need. Um, if you qualify for their um, application criteria, then you can apply for it. And they have a limitation, I believe it's about $3,000. Um, they're the only ones that have that limit and you can qualify for hospital beds. Um, so when you need a modification, I'll go through that at the end. Um, you could call your local LIN and have an OT involved uh, if you want to go through funding options or anything like that. Um, hospital beds, mattresses also differ. So the simple mattress, um, uh, people with pressure sores or anything, wounds or anything like that, they might need different types of mattresses. Um, so that must also be taken into consideration depending on your need. Um, there's air mattresses, gel mattresses, so a proper assessment of the person and how they can move, um, that can help you with getting a mattress and the hospital bed. Um, and osteoarthritis and the knees also make it hard to get on and off. So again, um, using the furniture risers or the adjustable beds and bed rails can be helpful. Um, another thing I usually recommend is keeping a commode or a urinal by your bedside. Um, if you notice that they are rushing to the bathroom in the middle of the night, uh, those are some things to consider uh, in the bedroom. Any questions? Question about hospital beds. Given the, pr the high price, is there any way to get a secondhand hospital bed or would that be questionable of the quality? So the frame, okay. So usually when we go looking for hospital, hospital beds secondhand, um, I tend to warn clients to look up, uh, look at the frame of the hospital bed. Um, they have the older, I've seen on Kijiji, they have the older metal, hospital bed that makes a lot of sound. I mean, if you could trial it and see it, if you go to the place and just ask them to turn it on, you can hear noise creaking. Those can just fall apart within two to three years. Um, I have also seen people get um, secondhand hospital bed frames, um, cheaper secondhand ones, uh, but they're good quality. Um, so you can definitely look for them, but just make sure that you have seen it with your own eyes and you know check like moved it up and down um and check that out before you purchase that uh the mattress is the only thing that I would ask clients to get through a vendor just because you don't know who used it what happened with it so that i would tell people to more likely you know get a new one but yes you can definitely look in 
to secondhand mattresses. I mean, secondhand hospital bed frames, they are available. Um, I've seen like expensive ones people have given out for like much cheaper than what they are actual. Okay, so the next area that I was going to cover is the kitchen. Um, so kitchen safety. Uh, the, I'm just not going to go through the whole, um, like kitchen safety is a huge, huge topic because there's so many areas, so many things to consider, especially people with different diagnoses have different needs. Um, I'm going to go through the basic ones. If you have any specific questions, you can always ask me. Uh, the first thing I usually tell people is to install the smoke carbon monoxide detectors. Um, that's the primary one that I usually say. Um, the next would be storing items. So storing items in cupboards when you can, where you can reach them safely, heavier items in lower cupboards and lighter items in higher uh, high cupboards. Um, again, reaching over can cause to increase the risk of falls, as well as if you have arthritis or pain that again, having items each in an easier to reach place helps you. Uh, pull out pantries to avoid reaching and placing microwave at or below the counter height. Um, another thing I usually recommend is rounding the kitchen, um, uh, rounding the kitchen, the edges of the counter. So, and the picture, on, I'm being touched, sorry. Whenever I touch it, it moves. So on the right-hand top corner, rounding the kitchen over there, uh, the countertops helps you um, reduce injury. Um, that's one of the biggest modification people usually make. Um, again, lever style fixtures instead of twist knobs. So motion sensing faucets are much better for people with pain in their joints. Um, and again, sitting when preparing meals if possible. Um, this is a, a stool with adjustable arms. Um, I've seen people use that, especially to conserve energy and to break down the steps in the kitchen. That usually helps. And when you have difficulty using the stove or turning the stove off, um, the long stove knob turners helps, especially with difficulties with turning um, because of arthritis. Uh, the knob stove, uh, long stove knob turners help that helps with that. Um, An automatic stove shut off. That's the picture that I have at the bottom, especially if you have someone with cognitive difficulties and they forget to turn on or turn off uh, the stove. Uh, automatic stove shut offs usually help you with that. So it's an attachment that comes. Um, I think Best Buy has it right now. Um, you can get it and you get it installed as well. I think it costs about $300. <clears throat> And the next section would be stair safety. Again, handrails on both sides of staircase, uh, making the stair edges stand out by marking them. So anti-slip stair treads helps. Uh, the back of each step of the staircase should be closed in um, and consider stair lift if it is difficult to manage going up and down the stairs. So again, here, the stair treads that helps with preventing falls, installing, um, both railings closing off at the back um, so that you don't get stuck even if you fall and stair lift. Um, so there's, there are a couple of options for stair lifts. There's even if you have a curved stair uh, at your house there, they have curved stair lifts as well. Uh, curved stair lifts are much more expensive than the straight ones that you, that you see in the picture. Um, yeah. And they also have smaller, um, shorter stair lifts for like, especially if you have a back split house with four steps or five steps, they do have that option where you can just put a small stair lift as well. Um, and I usually tell my clients to check different vendors so that you can compare the prices and get the best option for you. Uh, March of Dimes is an agency that uh, provides funding for our stair lift, but it is again an application process and whoever's completing the home safety assessment for you can help you fill out the application and let you know what paperwork you need. Any questions so far? Okay, now I'm gonna go through the bathroom. Um, the small changes, again, bathroom, there's small changes and major changes. 
Uh, let me go to the picture here. So these are small changes that I usually recommend to clients. So grab bars um, and then to get in and out of the bathtub, holding onto the grab bars helps. Uh, handheld showers um, and so that they don't have to set a stand up to get the shower and you know sit down or so that's why handheld shower up and you can reach places uh, with the handheld shower while the other shower it doesn't allow you to do that so um, non-slip mat inside and outside the bathtub um, this is called the tub transfer bench so this is for someone who has trouble lifting their leg and getting in so sitting in and scooching over um, to get inside the bathtub and out that helps um, or if you are okay with lifting your legs and getting in, I usually recommend a bath chair and a tub clamp on rail. The tub clamp on rail is on the lower right hand. So it hold, helps you hold and get in and out. Um, other major changes to consider would be something like bathtub cutouts. Um, this is when they cut out a section of your bathtub and you can easily get in and out. Um, and then, or changing the whole bathroom to a walk-in shower, especially if you have a wheelchair or a walker, it could just, the wheelchair can just roll in. Um, and that helps with getting in and out of the shower much more easily. And you can eliminate the risk of falling when you get in and out or a walk-in bathtub. A lot of my clients, they don't like showering. They prefer baths. Um, so that's another option. Um, so you can immerse yourself in the water when you get in. So a walk-in bathtub is also available. Uh, again, these modifications are pretty expensive. Um, and according, again, according to your financial need, or if you need any help, um, there are um, agencies, uh, organizations that help with funding. Again, that's an application process in itself. Um, the recommendations that I provided above does not apply for everyone. Uh, modifications should depend on each person's physical ability and living environment. So home, safe, uh, home safety assessment will help you identify which modification will be suitable for you. And funding, depending on your situation, there are organizations that can assist with providing funding for home safety equipment or modifications. So I've listed a couple of them, uh, depending on your financial status or need. Uh, March of Dimes, they do um, for uh, big major changes, as well as if you need a smaller equipment like a bath chair or um, a toilet safety frame, something like that, um, they, could, they do provide help with funding. Uh, but I think there's a financial criteria attached to it. Uh, same with Ceridian Cares. Um, and then there's MS Society of Canada and Toronto Hardship Fund. Um, again, all of them are, they do have a financial aspect to it. So you would have to provide your notice of assessment and things like that. Any questions before I move in? Just to... Have a How? Oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Just with all of the recommendations you provide, do you just provide the recommendations, or do you like kind of designate which option would be best suited for the patients or with the clients? So usually, I complete a home safety assessment, and then I recommend. These are just like the whole list of mm -hmm. recommendations. So it doesn't. That's why I mentioned it doesn't apply for everybody. Um, I, when I go in, I ask them to get in and out of the bathtub just to see how they're doing. I mean, sometimes they can't even get in and I know I can see that. Um, so I just, it's, that's why I always say first to have a home safety assessment so you can assess the client in the environment. And it's also depending on where they're living. So it can be an apartment, a house. So it might be the space limitation. So it might be a small bathroom, but like not everything can apply to everybody's, um, situation so it really depends on the person and the environment okay uh, how wide should your your door your doorway be i know in the older houses they didn't make them very wide um i believe i'm going to say this on the top of my head but i can check that out for you uh, to be more specific it 32 inches, I think, um, because we always uh, measure the wheelchairs too, because it has to be easily fit. Mm -hmm. um, 
especially with wheelchairs, I always say have two inches on either side mm -hmm. um, to be easily getting in and out. Uh, walkers are much more easier, but out of the top of my head, it's 32, but I can always check that uh, number for you okay. and let you know. And yes, as you mentioned, Bella, the older houses are much more small. I know that uh, I've had that problem before, especially with, um, then we have to have it measured. And sometimes some wheelchairs do come smaller, walkers come smaller. So yeah, that problems always exist, especially with the older house. Um, and how can I get a home safety assessment completed? You can visit your family doctor who can give you a referral to the local health integration network. Um, these are publicly funded OT services in your community. Um, so I believe the first step would be for a care co coordinator to call you and then they'll send an OT to do an in-home assessment um, and they can do a mobility assessment at that point as well. Um, I put the one for Central East, which is the Scarborough region. So that's the number at the bottom, 416. 750 um, This is for the publicly funded uh, program. If you're seeking a private occupational therapy services, um, sorry, you can always um, go into the Ontario Society of Occupational Therapists and there's an online search tool. And this is private services you would have to pay out of pocket. Uh, while with local health integration network, um, it's covered through your OHIP but you might, you have to be eligible for the home safety assessment part. So they'll let you know if you're eligible or not. Okay, so I will, if everybody's okay, I can move on to the next topic, but if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. So I'm just gonna go over mobility aids. Mobility aids help people who have difficulty moving around enjoy greater freedom and independence. Uh, benefits of using a mobility aid is more independence, reduced pain, increased self-esteem. So the first one I'm going to go over is uh, standard walkers or manual walkers. Uh, you've probably seen this a lot, especially at the hospital. They tend to use them because they're more sturdy. Uh, someone who walks at a slower pace and who, is more, um, who can move more, uh, and walk better than using a wheelchair can use a standard walker, uh, especially if you had a hip or knee replacement, usually they recommend standard walkers. Um, and someone with cognitive deficits, um, again, standard walks, uh, walkers are recommended. Uh, they have adjustable height. Uh, you can either have no wheels to four wheels. So some of them with, uh, come with no wheels, so because just because you need more support when moving. Uh, and then there are the two wheeled options as well as the four wheel. Uh, the front wheels can be fixed or they can be swiveled wheels. Um, again, it depends on the person. Um, some of them might find it difficult to have swivel wheels because that uh, bothers them with the balance. Um, if wheels are present at back, so if there's a four wheeled walker, they usually have auto stop wheels um, so that you can slow down. Next one I'll be going through is rollators. Uh, rollators are the ones with the seat. That's why I usually tell clients to recognize them. A uh, rollator gives you support and mobility over long distance. It enhances uh, mobility and walking speed. Um, keep in mind, learning to use a rollator is hard for someone with cognitive deficits just because they have the brakes. Um, and I find that, that it's hard for them to use the brakes before they have to sit down. So I've seen people fall um, because they don't have, um, they don't know to put on the brakes before they sit down. So always be careful before you purchase a rollator. Again, it's best to have someone come in and complete an assessment and let you know which mobility aid is suitable for you. Uh, so rollators tend to have large wheels because it helps to roll over uneven and uneven ground. Um, the standard walkers are usually recommended indoors when you're inside the house. It's much more easier to use the walkers because the wheels are small and they don't have any treads on them. Uh, but rollators do come uh, with the capability of moving them outside and inside. Um, there are two types of rollator. I don't want to go through too much detail to overwhelm you. The type two rollators are more for indoors. And then there's the type three that you can use outdoors um, and indoors because the wheels are much more bigger. 
uh, rollators do come with the seat to sit, uh, especially when you're walking long distance and need to take a break. Um, and they have the basket to carry items. There are foldable options available. Um, and some of the rollators come with the lock brakes or slow down brake. Um, so when you're going down, you can control the speed by just pressing the brake slightly. Any question in terms of rollators or walkers? I have a question and it might not be in your scope, but um, have you seen any good strategies to convince someone to use a walker or a rollator if they have some hesitation because they feel that it looks old or that they don't need it? I do encounter with that problem a lot. I mean, at the end of the day, it is the person's choice, but I always give them this, you know, facts about falls and, you know, reducing falls, but I'm, sometimes I let them um, see the different options. There are, there's not one specific walker that's available. There are different types. Um, so it's almost like going shopping for a car. Um, so I usually tell my vendor to bring two or three options, which to get them involved in the process so that they could choose the one that they feel, you know, that suits their needs. And there's even color options. So they we give them different types of options so that to make it more appealing to the client. Um, Cause it is almost like purchase. That's why we say it's almost like purchasing a car. So when they go through those options and they, when they have that options provided to them, not just like this is the rollator, go with it. Um, they, they're more likely to choose one that fits them, but using them daily, it is on the client themselves. Um, I, you know, I let them know the benefits of it and I recommend it, but at the end of the day, it's um, their choice. Um, yeah, so that we do hit that block whenever I see a client, so it's hard. Okay, um, so usually the assessment can be done by a physiotherapist or an occupational therapist, and they'll help you to find a role later appropriate to your mobility needs, height, weight, and environment. <coughs> Especially the height, um, it, it comes in three different sizes. So uh, your feet should be touching the floor when you're sitting on the seat of the rollator. So again, getting that measured and getting the appropriate one is uh, the best way to go. As I've seen clients who get seats that are higher and they fall off from the seats when they're trying to get on and off. So always get an assessment done by a PT or an OT and that'll help too. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> wheelchairs, depending on a person's mobility, uh, there are different types of wheelchairs. It's a little spudge. I need to spudge like that. Okay. Uh, wheelchairs in Canada range from type one to five, and they progressively adapt to the user's needs and mobility. So there are different surfaces, support options, hardware, footwear. Uh, foot support, sorry, uh, accessories. Um, so a mobility assessment completed by an OT or a PT will help you get the appropriate wheelchair. So these are the types of wheelchairs that are available and it's a big list and it's overwhelming. So they go from transport wheelchair. So I'm just gonna give you a little brief description um, about each type. Um, so on the left top corner, I've labeled it. So it's transport wheelchair. Those are for just short-term travel purposes, especially if they only need it when they go for appointments and some there's a caregiver to push the wheelchair just because if you notice it comes with small wheels. Um, so if there's a caregiver or someone to push the wheelchair and they only need it when they have to go for appointments, I would recommend a transport wheelchair. If they're walking in inside the house with the walker and they're okay with it, then they don't really need a wheelchair. It's only if it's snowing and the conditions are not great to use the walker outside. That's when I recommend a transport wheelchair. Uh, the type one is at the bottom. Uh, it's more rigid, heavier. Um, I haven't seen a lot of people use type one. Um, so, that is, again, for someone who uses it occasionally, I usually don't recommend type one as much as I, as I don't think I usually have to recommend it. Um, it's type two and type three are the commonly used wheelchairs. Type two is for more active wheelchair user. 
it's uh, much more lighter than type one. And then as you go up, it becomes progressively uh, more customizable. Uh, so again, type three has more customization. So um, they're lightweight, but they have uh, the chair maximized for performance. Uh, that's for someone who can push the wheels by themselves and move it around. So it comes with anti-tip um, feature at the back. So type three is much more. And then again, type four is much for a more higher uh, active user. If you notice, it looks a little different. Um, so the wheels are much more closer. There's no armrest, they can transfer by themselves. So that's much for a much more active user. Um, in the community, I usually recommend either type two or type three. That's what I've noticed. I haven't had an opportunity to recommend type four. I haven't seen anyone use it as much. And then the last one at the bottom is the type five. These are for people who can't shift their own weight. Um, so they need the tilting feature that helps relieve pressure on the back. Um, so even the seat at the bottom, the cushion itself is um, customized according to where they put more pressure on. Um, so they need a caregiver for that, or they do have options where they can tilt by themselves um, to relieve pressure. Uh, and then I also have the scooter at the side over there. Um, with funding, there's not a lot of options for scooter, but again, that helps if you're, you know, just to want to be mobile and going out in the community, um, a scooter helps. Again, it depends on if you have space to store it, especially if you're in the apartment, you need to have a spot to store it. Um, it comes with batteries and things like that. Um, and a healthcare provider completes a physical, cognitive, environmental, and functional abilities assessment to, de to determine what mobility aid would fit for you. Um, so in terms of funding, uh, the assistive devices program uh, is a program that is offered by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. It provides funding to Ontario residents who have long-term physical disabilities uh, for assistive devices appropriate to their individual needs. The funding can be up to 75% of the device. Um, so the eligibility is that you, might, you must be an Ontario resident and you should have a Ontario valid Ontario health card and have a disability requiring a mobility aid for six months or longer. So this program does not consider your income. So it just considers your disability and your physical abilities. So the ADP process, I'm just gonna go through a little bit about the ADP process. It's an assessment, uh, an assessment needs to be completed and the application needs to be submitted to ADP. So the ADP authorizer, so I'm an ADP authorizer. I had to apply for it separately after finishing school. Um, I would complete the assessment in the client's own environment. So things I usually consider it, the house itself, if they have what type of entrance they have, how are they transferring, um, do they have a caregiver at home, what are their physical needs, these are things that I consider when I go into a person's house. Um, always have the ADP authorized to complete the assessment at your home. I've had people or vendors who suggest sometimes, you know, you could do the assessment at their place, but I highly recommend you not to do that. Um, and an ADP authorizer will let you know that they need to complete the assessment at the client's home because that's where they're gonna use the mobility aid. And that's what the funding is for, is for you to use inside the house and to get in and out of the house. So, um, because you might not know what type of housing situation they have, like, can recommend a wheelchair, but do they have a ramp to get in and out? Where are they storing it? So things like that. Uh, there's also power wheelchairs. Um, again, these are things to consider. So always have the assessment completed in your home. Um, and then the ADP authorizer will coordinate a consultation with the vendor to determine the appropriate uh, mobility aid. So they can bring... Um, couple of options for you to trial. Um, usually we give a couple, maybe a couple of weeks to trial the equipment in your house um, to see if it's suitable for you. Um, so you can get it in and out. So these are trial uh, wheelchairs, walkers. Um, you can try to see if it fits with you. Um, 
sorry, I have a question in the chat. And I also have a question. Um, could you clarify what ADP stands for? Sure. So it's the Assistive Devices Program. I'm going to go back a little bit. So it's the Assistive Devices Program. It's from it's by the Ministry of Long Term. Um, it's a pro, uh, it's a program offered through the Ministry of Health and Long Term Care. Um, so they provide funding for uh, mobility aid, adaptive uh, aids. So um, there's different things that they provide funding for. I'm specialized with mobility aid, so that's what I usually work with. But they do provide funding for um, I heard hearing. Um, aids and things like that, but I don't want to speak about it because I'm not too sure of other funding options, but I know they do provide that. Um, I'm specialized for just funding, filling out the funding information and prescribing appropriate uh, mobility equipment. Um, and it's, it's a program in Ontario, so it's only Ontario residents who are eligible to apply for this. And it's up to 75% of the device because wheelchairs and wheelchairs, walkers are pretty expensive so especially with walkers um they can be like four hundred dollars the really good ones um so they provide up to 75 percent of the funding and the client pays the 25 percent uh usually that's how it happens so it's about a hundred dollars for a walker that they would pay the government will fund for up to 75 percent um again wheelchairs are also expensive they're about they can range from two thousand higher so up to 75 percent funding is available through the government again you have to apply and see if you will uh, be qualified for it and it is not considered your income so it's only your physical ability and disability that you have so the adp authorizer will coordinate a consultation with the vendor so you can try the device and then the application is completed and submitted to ADP. Um, the authorizer, the vendor, and the client are notified if the funding is approved. Then you pay the 25% to the vendor. Um, there's also other options available. If you have difficulty paying the 25%, um, you can apply through other organizations that help you with that as well. Um, and this is, again, the contact information uh, for the local health integration network um, to for publicly funded OT services. Um, they can also, I'm not sure if the physiotherapists um, with uh, the Lynn do uh, ADP assessment, but you can always call them and ask, uh, but OTs do mobility assessments and that's the number 416 and if you need more, if you have more questions in regards to the assistive devices program, and that's the number at the bo uh, bottom, ADP at Ontario, uh, sorry, the phone number is 416-327-8804, or you can email them at adp at ontario.ca. Any questions or concerns, you can always, the one thing that I didn't mention here, uh, there's wheelchairs, scooters, but there's also power wheelchairs. Um, I didn't have, I didn't put a picture over here. I just remembered it right now. So that can be done as well. That has funding of it, uh, availability through the ADP program. Um, again, that's for someone who can't um, push the wheelchair by themselves um, and they need a uh, mobility device to move around in the house. So again, an assessment needs to be done to see if you will um, be eligible to get a power wheelchair. Again, power wheelchairs are quite heavy. Uh, they have a battery, um, so they need to have, um, it, the house has to be easily accessible. Um, so the bedroom has to be on the same floor. Uh, the front entrance um, should be easily accessible. So they need to have a ramp in place. So these things need to be in place before you go for a power wheelchair. And again, an assessment needs to be done as well to see if you are eligible to get an power wheelchair. 